Being Black in America comes with its challenges. However, we understand that enlightenment through education is the oppressor's worst fear. By bridging the gap between academia and the people, our purpose is to equip you with knowledge that breaks down barriers during your journey towards truth and freedom. Welcome to the Black and Highly Dangerous Podcast. Yo, Dad, what's up? What's up? How's this past week been for you? What's been going on? You know, this week has been cool. I think it's my... It was like the first full week without any like class related duties. Okay. I have to grade, but like those assignments and stuff don't come in until next week. So it was like my first like off week and I got a lot done. I told you that I was doing like these like abstracts for like all the papers I want to publish over like my tenure track. Yeah, I think so. So, yeah, I got 14 of those written. Oh, wow. Okay. Which is like a really big deal yeah. because it's like I had to like work through all of like the potential arguments and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And they're not perfect. But to do that brain work in advance, like the thinking is the hard part. Yeah. I also hit my weight loss goal. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Since for January 3rd, I have lost. 17 and a half pounds. Oh, nice. Yes. That's so good. I was trying to get back down to 135. That was my pre Harvard weight. So, guys, I didn't always weigh that. When I got to Purdue, I made friends with this very uh, wild person who liked to work out and was just <laughs> like so intense about it. And his name was Terrell. And <laughs> So we were in Black Graduate School, Student Association, and I remember one time we had like what it was like Fit Club. Or yeah, like BJSA that. Fit Club, BJ Fit Club. <laughs> yeah, so I started like my fitness journey like while at Purdue, partly motivated by like Terrell and some of the people there. And so before I got to Harvard, I was like really, really fit. And then when I got to Harvard, I fell off. And so now <laughs> I'm back at the pre-Harvard slash end of Purdue. Wait, okay, and I'm really okay. proud. You know, that's funny because that's the same same exact kind of weight goals I have. My goal right now has been trying to get back to my Purdue weight. Um, so it's just funny, like how that time period for us was just like, okay, we were in really good shape. Majority of us, I even I was uh, talking to Eric, um, Eric, our friend Eric already the other day, who's like now super yes. you know, professional fitness guy. Congratulations <laughs> to him. I know he won a title. Yeah, he just did a fitness competition maybe a couple, few weeks ago and he took uh, first place in one of the categories and stuff like that. So he's been killing it. Um, but he always, you know, hits me up like, oh, yeah, man, I got to always give, uh, <laughs> um, you know, onus to you because you're the one that pushed me. I remember Eric used to be in the gym. He would work out, but I would just always get on him because he'd be in there just doing the same weight over. And I'm like, come on, Eric, man, let's put some more weight on them, on them benches. <laughs> I won't lie, though. Ever. So, man, we still, oh, he still works <laughs> my nerves because it was like, you need to go to the gym. you just doing those little dance videos at home. Like, it, oh, it used to really make me mad but I did become like a weight person lift I haven't lifted this year just because you know I haven't been like in a yeah. normal gym uh, yeah. but I do actually miss lifting weights good good yeah no lifting weights is fun that's always been my favorite activity and cardio has been secondary um so yeah every time I seen folks in the gym I was like come on let's let's lift some weights but it's just funny how that Purdue time but like I said is the origin story for a lot of our fitness journeys and now you know, in our mid-30s, we're trying to get back to that, <laughs> our mid-20 weight. <laughs> it's just good for me to know that it's possible. I remember telling somebody, because technically I've lost 25 pounds since last June, okay. but 17 of that 25 has just been from January because I moved and like mm -hmm. things slowed down a bit. Mm -hmm. And I remember like, it was like in 2020, I was trying to tell somebody that like, oh, I want to lose 20 pounds. And they were like, girl, are you sure? You like uh, 35 now? Like, you know, <laughs> you older. That seems like a lot of weight. No, is it even possible? And it's possible. No, it definitely is. It is. And I mean, and I know because we wa I watch, Kristen watches all, a lot of those shows. Um, 
you know, those weight loss shows and people be in their forties and fifties losing all that weight. So I'm like, yeah, definitely in our mid thirties, it is definitely not too late now. Has the metabolism changed and can I lose weight as quickly as I did in my mid twenties? No, <laughs> but can I still lose the weight? Yes. And I think that was one of the bigger adjustments for me this time around was just trying to, you know, realize, okay, I can't because when I was at Purdue in them twenties, man, I could just drop weight at the drop of a dime. And now it's a slower process. So I have to Keep talking to myself, remain consistent, keep working, keep working. And then you do see the weight come off. So I would say that's the difference. But it is definitely, like you said, still 100 percent possible at any age. Yeah, I think that's the thing. Realizing that like my cal- caloric need like during the day, if I'm not doing anything, it's just so low. So mm-hmm. for me, I have to be active if I actually want to be able to enjoy uh, food, food and life. <laughs> yeah. And just as you grow older, that caloric need just like decreases. Even mm-hmm. as you lose weight, it decreases. So that's just something you have to deal with. If you try to get a little active, you can eat more calories. Yeah, yeah, no, that is true. That is true. The activity definitely helps you still enjoy some enjoy some of the good food, um, and that's one of the main my main motivations of staying active because it's like I can't. I know I'm not that type of person. I got to eat clean twenty four seven to keep this weight loss down. I can't do it. So that's a part of the reason. Okay, let me go to the gym so that if I do want something today, you know, I can still enjoy it and not feel guilty or not take me too off track of my weight loss goal. So yeah. So shout out to you, Dad, for reaching for reaching those goals um, and hitting that goal that you set out already. And we're only midway, almost midway through the year, not even yet, all the way through. So now, now I guess what the goal is to try to maintain for the remainder of the year. You're going to keep trying to dip down some more. So I decided I do want to try to lose like three more pounds. Okay, three, okay. just get That's a little cushion. Doable. Yeah, I think I want some cushion, and then it's trying to maintain from there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Ma- maintaining it is to me the easier part. The lo- the weight loss is always the more challenging um, part for me. Uh, so good. So good. You're already there. So that's good. Motivation to the rest of y'all. You know, I know some of y'all, I know Daph wasn't the only one in 2022 with fitness goals. I know some of our listeners do too. So hopefully y'all are still striving and motivating to get where you need to be. And, you know, give us some of uh, those praise reports if you want. Slide in our DMs or whatever yes, we'd like to, <laughs> like yes. to hear. How y'all be doing you out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What about you? How was your week? The week has been fine. I wrapped up classes, so that was good. Um, and now I'm just same, same to you, same like you, just grading uh, this upcoming week. Well, really, probably these next couple of days. I'll have to get my grading done out the way. And then, um, you know, and put those final grades. I got one more little, like, senior send-off event that we do at the end of every year, this this upcoming Wednesday. And then after that, you know, then I'm completely, like, done with campus and all those kind of obligations so so that'll be good but yeah at least the teaching stuff is out the way and this close to you know summer <laughs> and enjoying that so um like i said like i said this before i'm looking forward to it because like our first summer back in back in out outside uh for real for real without you know covid is definitely still there but i think the pressure of intensity of covid has died down so much and now we can like enjoy our summer after these past couple years mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i've been like trying to track down all the like outdoor restaurants and stuff like that in philly so that we can mm-hmm. like enjoy summer still yeah, trying yeah. to be safe mm-hmm. uh, just because like thinking about like the white house correspondents dinner like all of everyone up with COVID. Yep. i think there are ways to like enjoy life and be safe and that is my goal this summer. Mm-hmm. No, that's good. No, that's a good goal. That's a good goal. All right. So let's um, get to some old Lord news. There's some interesting stories that I have, and I'm sure you have too. And then we'll talk about today's topic, um, which is a big topic this past week. But we'll we'll talk about that after we get some of the old Lord news. Hello, and welcome to BHD News, where we give you the most current and eye-opening old Lord news of the week. Join us as we present news that'll make you want to say. Okay, I'll start with some positive news before we get into the like very wild things. Um, I just saw a report that scientists have developed glasses that can beam images directly into the brain, bypassing the eyes, which okay. is mm. hopeful news for those who are blind. Ah, okay, okay, okay. I like yes, that. Lord! That's yeah. so good. At first, I was like, where's where's this about to go? Why are we beaming things into our brain? But 
if it's for that purpose, then that's actually really, really cool. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, Stevie Wonder actually backed some similar gla- get glasses at a tech fair uh, okay. in March, uh, I think last year or something like that. So okay. it's been developing. They've been testing them in, I think, maybe chimps or, yeah. Okay. Yeah, one of our that makes sense. <laughs> uh, cousins, uh, private yeah, yeah, yeah. cousins or something, uh, and they are showing some uh, promise. So, no, that's good. No, that's tech. This shows where technology can take us. Um, yeah, that would just be so phenomenal because we know, you know, being blind, we, you know, you hear people who are deaf, people who are blind. Those are some really tough things to deal with, but definitely not being able to see. I'm sure is like very challenging. Um, cause I, I mean, and the, the interesting thing is that we know there's advancements with like the hearing aids and stuff like that. So people who aren't like, you know, hundred percent deaf, they can still be able to hear some things, uh, but really haven't seen those kind of advancements with sight. And so using technology to get us to that point is really, really, um, is great. Um, and it's going to be life changing for so many different people. And yeah, hopefully they continue. This is the kind of stuff, you know, the government and other folks and corporations, this kind of technology is what you need to back. Um, because it's, it's definitely where we need to go. So good, good. That's a very uplifting story. I'm glad yes. you shared that first. I always start with the uplifting. <laughs> Before we get to the wild child, okay. Mm-hmm. Tell me why uh, two to three Michigan teenagers okay. were had a plot to try to blackmail a teacher oh, God. after he sent them some explicit images and videos. Oh, God. Now, so that's not even where it gets wild because you're like, okay. well, why did he send them My images guess probably was an and videos? Mm-hmm. That is because they catfished him on a dating site oh, pretending to be God. a 35 year old woman. Oh. The teacher didn't even know that he had been catfished and that he had sent those images to students until sheriffs came to his home to tell him that his images have been passed around the school oh my god that is so embarrassing (laughs) (laughs) oh man that's a tough one they are terrible yeah that's uh yeah that sucks um yeah that's terrible because them students they're wrong for that uh and, you know, and then he, you know, doing something, you know, which is p- what people do in this day and age. It's not extreme, especially, you, you know, dating and trying to get to know somebody. And he thought he was doing it with an adult. Oh, God, that's tough. Yeah, that's tough. Um, and they try to blackmail him, which clearly wasn't going to work because they're in the wrong. That's some you know, teenagers clearly not thinking this all the way through. But now that's that's crazy. That's super embarrassing. Um, yeah. The fact because, you know, teenagers, they're going to pass that around. How many students have seen that? Now, you know, the sheriff's department has seen it. Um, hopefully, you know, it wasn't nothing too crazy. I don't know, <laughs> you know it was news. Still... <laughs> oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's tough. It's tough coming back from that one. So, um, yeah, I, I, I have to, I'd to have to figure leave. out what the punishment will be for the teens because they did not go through with the blackmail, but they were thinking about it. Yeah. Um, and so they're trying to figure out, like, if there's anything to be done but the teacher yeah. is not in trouble because he technically yeah he didn't know yeah because um, that stuff can get tricky you know with like you know child pornography or like some kind of indecency whatever um with you know engaging from minor and that matter but again like i said he didn't know um and there's probably tons of evidence and dms to show that he thought it was a real person so <laughs> So, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And then you don't want to, you know, teenagers, they were very wrong. But then, you know, you don't want to be too punitive because they're doing something silly what teenagers do. Uh, But, yes, this man's, you know, it has to be like psychological, you know, distress from something like that, for sure. Like like walking into school knowing like who's seen it, who didn't see it. That's like that's that's a lot of anxiety right there. We talk about anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, It's crazy. Yeah. Okay, so, Terrell, imagine this scenario. Mm-hmm. You take your car in for an oil change, okay. you pass over the keys to the dealership or, mm-hmm. you know, the oil change uh, company. Yes. And one of the employees gets into your car and accidentally runs over another employee. Oh, okay. And you are sued because the law says... Mm-hmm. The person can't sue the dealership. 
What? No, that's that. That's that's well, crazy. Well, that happened to <laughs> a Michigan Jeep owner who okay. was sued for a mechanic's death after one of the fellow employees ran over uh, nah. the person, and that is because it was something in like Michigan law that is like like uh oh somebody can't be sued for like employee work compensation yeah. type issue i don't know it's some weird law and because the family could not sue the dealership they actually sued the jeep owner wow that's wild but here's the twist there is kind of like this loophole to where as soon as that family filed a lawsuit against the Jeep owner, the Jeep owner was able to file a lawsuit against the dealership for indemnification or something okay. like that and okay. won. So now technically when the family sues and wins, although the Jeep owner will be named, the Jeep, uh, the dealership will actually have to pay Jeep for it. Pay. But isn't okay. that why? That is wild. Maybe, maybe there was like some kind of um, agreement, you know, with the family or whomever saying, hey, this is the route we have to go to penalize them. I can see that happening because um, if somebody came up like, whoa, whoa, this is I would even feel bad as, you know, the victim's family suing someone who didn't do anything wrong. That seems like, you know, over the top. But talking to lawyers, they probably say, here's a roundabout way of doing that. So then I will let that person know this is what you need to do. And then we all, you know, yeah, we all get compensated. The the issue, this is why the story is even more just like why is because the employee that ran over the other employee uh, didn't have a license and didn't know how to drive. Mm, OK, that's even. And so it was just kind of like pure negligence. It. So what I actually read, Michigan workers compensation law does not allow someone to sue a fellow employee for negligence on the job. And so that's okay. technically how the dealership was, you know, like, oh, mm. we can't be sued. But this kind of like loophole allows them yeah. to still sue. OK. OK, well, that makes sense. Well, at least, you know, they found a way to get, you know, justice and get compensated for that wrongful death. Um, but yeah, there were so many different things going wrong with that. Like you said, not having even the requirements to drive a car working at a dealership. Um, that's already a big red flag, and there should be some legal I mean, legal accountability for that as well, and that led to someone's death. So they're going to have to cough up some money. Um, but no, that's interesting. Good to know. These weird kind of laws and things like that in all these different states and how they play out. Yes. Um, okay, so for this other story, um, we know it's like primary season. You know, people are trying to be elected. Well, one candidate... And I think it's an Indiana, yeah, in an Indiana town, uh, wanted to sit on like some like board or governing body in their Indiana city. And he won his primary from jail. Oh, oh wow. Okay. <laughs> uh, he was actually, he still got 60 votes despite being in jail for uh, actually murdering his wife. Oh, wow. So uh, that's wild. Some people still thought that he'd be good. Now, I guess the the that's deal crazy. with this is that, like, I guess it could be three people in that primary to like get seated on the board. But the fact that he still received any votes at all, like, yeah, oh. that's wild. Um, yeah, yeah, killing your wife, you know, being in jail f for murder and still running that's a bit that's a bit of a stretch you know if it was you know something else something lighter i could see it but that that's a pretty severe offense and i don't think you should you know qualify <laughs> especially if you've been convicted of this crime uh to be able to run for any kind of office because that's somebody who's you know clearly not all the way there all the way right clearly not clearly not what you got for us a uh, couple stories um so I, i'll ask you this question right if you work for nasa and, uh, you know, they they asked you, hey, Daph, you know, we're going to take some images and send them out to space just in case there's other life forms out there. <laughs> what kind of things would you think would be worthy of sending out to, you know, people, other beings out there in the universe? Okay, I know, I know where this is going. Uh, <laughs> I would send them pictures of like 
our ecosystem, okay. like, you know, water, the trees, send them pictures of like actual people. Yes. Like this is what our life form looks like, yes. you know, stuff like that. Exactly. I'm along the lines with you. So in my world, so in the animals, so in the people, let them know that, hey, so in my technology, cars and buildings, right? There's tons of images you can see. But for some reason, NASA has decided, similar to that teacher uh, who got catfished, uh, to send nudes out into space uh, to the aliens, uh, which is, you know, caused a lot of funny conversations in social media. Like, why would y'all choose that? But they are definitely planning to send nudes out there um, to the alien life forms, um, which is be some of the first images they see if they are out there, which, you know, is a high likelihood they might be out there and somehow get these images. But I thought that was, you know, funny. And what was so weird about the nudes, though, is that they look like old, like, video game, like, kind (laughs) of like, these, like, it looked like like an Atari or a a Nintendo, like, Mm -hmm. type nudes. Like, the graphics were just like, why this? I don't know. I don't know what NASA thing. All that technology, they can go to space and send droids and things to Mars and all these different planets and to the sun. And those are the kind of images we would like to send out to space. Uh, questionable, questionable, questionable. They should have, you know, maybe did, did a poll right around the country or something like, what should we send? Uh, but somebody in there, this has to be some kind of inside joke. Actually, that would have been a good way to engage people like, oh, what should we send? Yeah, yeah. Right. Engage everyone. I think that would have been a cool, you know. Um, see what people vote on and, and what we like to send out in space. So I'm sure this hopefully won't be the first type of images, but it's sad to see, I guess, or funny to see that that's the first type of images they chose. Um, okay. Outside of that, another story that I've been seeing around, which, you know, something I just want to mention is that we've talked about again every week. I feel like I'm talking about new stories about, um, you know, the supply chain issues and things that are shortages. We talk about soybeans, talk about all these different kinds of stuff. And now there's a new Shortage that is very troubling, which has to do with um, uh, formulas for babies. Um, I think this major factory somewhere in Michigan got shut down because of federal regulations. There were like a lot of issues and violations they had and they were already trouble and, you know, pretty, um, uh, you know, tight when it comes to the formula because of the all the other things going around the world with shortages. And now with this major, uh, you know, formula factory in Michigan shutting down. It has created a lot of shortages. Um, And the issue is that, too, there's a lot of infants who have, you know, certain dietary issues and autoimmunes and they need a special type of formula. And there are moms out there like we can't get this. And now my child's life is in jeopardy. Um, A lot of places like CVS have been, you know, limiting people, kind of what we saw in the pandemic, like toilet paper and water. Same thing. Hey, you can only buy like two you know, containers of formula, et cetera, a person. And so it's caused a lot of stress. Um, And so these are the things, right? We're seeing, essentially these are signs definitely heading to a recession, but how these are going to impact folks. I mean, formula is already expensive, so I can only imagine the new price of formula and inflation that, you know, I don't, we don't use formula, but I can imagine it was already high and it's probably higher now. And now even having less of it may even drive up the cost, Uh, but people need these and babies need this to survive. So uh, it's a really scary thing. Um, you know, so if anyone, you know, knows of anything or can help folks in these situations, you know, I urge you all to to think about figuring out how to lend a helping hand if possible uh, with this formula stuff. Yes. You know, it, uh, it was actually a few weeks ago when I was supposed to go home to Chattanooga to visit a uh, family. And I had a conversation with my bestie, Shika, who was on the podcast before, you know, she mm-hmm. had a baby. She was she was telling me about that, how like she would drive, she would be driving like all over the city. And oh, even wow. like, so in our city, like Georgia's like, right, is like the border's right there. So, you know, she driving back and forth across the border, like, mm. going to all these CVSs and Walgreens and everywhere trying Terrible. to find formula. And like part of like me going down there you know, I was going to be on a hunt for formula to see if I can grab like one or two. But of course, I wasn't mm-hmm. able to make it. Yeah. Uh, but it's just so it's it's scary. It is. That's it's like, you're, you know, it's like as a parent, you're in like this real helpless because you're dependent on these companies to deliver this product. Right? This is food um, for infants who can't eat anything. Right. They can't chew. They need these milk products. Um, and if you're not able to breastfeed, right. I know that that's an issue for a lot of women too. 
then you're relying on this to for the survival of your child. And that's a really, you know, scary situation. You know, I'm not too far removed from having that with my daughter. Um, although she was breastfed, but just thinking about like, what if we were in that situation and the links I probably would go to same thing. I'd be traveling all over the place, just stacking up, stacking up because my baby needs to eat. But it's like we shouldn't be in these situations. I know there are a lot of um, activists and advocate groups, you know, pushing this on the agenda or raising awareness to politicians saying, hey, this is nothing. Y'all just can't look over. Y'all have to give resources to folks and babies who need these um, things or figure out a way to open up that facility back really quickly. Right. Mm -hmm. Are the regulations that serious now where babies can potentially die? Like get what they need to be fixed. Make sure it's safe. Watch them. But. Let them still produce what they need to produce because you're shutting them down entirely. It's clearly especially since we havoc. so pro life, you know. Yeah, it's so pro life. We'll get to that in a minute because that is just a whole different ball game right there. Um, okay, and another story I had was about um, the this. You know, we've been talking again about the economy and all this other kind of stuff. And another a recent report has come out that. Signs of the great resignation we thought were going to, a lot of experts thought was going to, you know, slow down. A lot of people just quitting their job, but it's continued at this rapid pace that we've never seen before in this country. Um, there have been, uh, within the first quarter, 4.5 million, additional 4.5 million Americans who have quit their jobs. This is a trend we saw in the pandemic. Um, and now people thought, okay, once the pandemic lines up, people are going to stay with their jobs. But that is not the case. And so we see a lot of companies uh, trying to figure out what's happening. It's interesting, though, because 11.5 million jobs have also been created and open. So it could be that people say, hey, I'm not suffering at this job anymore. I'm finding new opportunities because there are more job opportunities. And now, you know, it's creating this inter interesting dynamic between employers and employees now that places. I know my brother, he... Um, recently quit one job because this other similar job opened up a competitor and they were like poaching a bunch of people. And so better opportunity, better pay, et cetera. Um, that wasn't far from where he was currently working. So I see a lot of this happening too, but I think this is just a pretty, a pretty interesting trend, especially heading in towards a recession that folks are still like, you know what? My peace and happiness is way better than making sure my employer is happy and having their peace. Um, so I think, hey, that's the way to go. That's the way to go. And the, the companies will have to adjust. These employers ain't loyal. They're not. And They're not. you have to be loyal to yourself um, mm -hmm. and your family. So if there are better opportunities, take them. Yeah, take them. Take them um, for sure. Um, and one last story. Uh, I thought the story was kind of crazy. Um, uh, there was this funeral in Peru, um, a woman who had died, recently died. And during, you know, the funeral, um, uh, apparently um, she wasn't dead. And she woke up and started banging on the coffin to get out. <laughs> oh, I would be traumatized. <laughs> oh, man, we all would be traumatized. That is a very traumatic thing. Um, apparently... She um, now still she still ended up dying. But what happened is that um, when they opened the casket, she was banging. Her eyes were wide open um, before that. I guess she they thought she had died because she had gotten into a catastrophic car accident um, in some region, which killed pretty much everyone who was in the car. And I think her nephew was seriously injured, but didn't die. Um, but she was pronounced dead. And so all her relatives planned for the funeral. But um, she wasn't actually dead um, in the first place. I think her vitals were just super, super low um, that she wasn't actually, you know, we've kind of seen these things on TVs before in these extreme situations. And it was one of those kind of cases where she was still slightly breathing and slightly alive. When she woke up, they rushed her to the hospital, put her on, you know, life support. But she still ended up dying a few hours later. Um, uh, you know, that has to be also traumatic because it's like, Will they think like, oh, we could have done something sooner? And I guess they just have like different uh, processes for like burying. Because yeah. the reason that wouldn't happen in the U.S. is we're, we're embalmed. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think, yeah, I don't think clearly that that was not <laughs> the same process because there was no, no you can't live after you are embalmed. Um, and so, yeah, and I think it sounds like they probably also worked quicker, too, right, from from death to funeral, it probably, you know, sometimes in the U.S. takes about a week or so. And that's saying like it might happen within a day or two, right, for it to still be that kind of situation. Um, so I thought that was just like, yeah, like you said, very traumatic for everyone there. I'm sure if the kids were there as well, there's like, 
no coming back from that for a while. Um, see somebody you thought was dead coming back to life. Mm-hmm. But, you know, crazy things happen. And that's why I shared it here at Oh Lord News, because that was definitely Oh Lord word newsworthy. Um, okay, let's, uh, I guess, move into the big topic of the week. Uh, you know, Daph and I felt like, you know, we, we had another topic planned, but when this news came about, we're like, no, we cannot not talk about what transpired this past week. And we've had conversations about this in the past. And we're all kind of holding our breath, hoping that the right thing would be done. But with the draft that came out, thanks to the political insider, whoever it was at the Supreme Court, uh, it was found that they are, the Supreme Court is looking to overturn Roe v. Wade. So, Daph, what are your you know, thoughts about what happened this past week in this news? One, I feel like the way this all came about, you know, with the leak. Mm -hmm. And I I remember like when I first saw somebody tweeting about it, I don't know if I thought it was just people like debating what could, like what could happen in the future. And I think it took me a second to like grasp that, oh, wow. The majority opinion was actually leaked and this is happening. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. yeah, it just, it really, I don't know, it really hit home because I am a 36 year old married woman who is interested in starting a family, but things don't always go as planned. There's atopic pregnancies. There there are a lot of things that could go wrong Mm -hmm. that could require in order to save the life of the mother or, you know, save the life of the child to like abortion or like, you know, early delivery or whatever it is. And I'll be honest, one of the first things I, I did was like, John, we need to have a baby or need to try to have a baby in Pennsylvania because I don't, I would not feel comfortable Mm. having a baby in Tennessee. And that's Mm -hmm. my home state. Mm -hmm. Because ain't nobody finna tell me my life ain't worth living and that I deserve to die. Like, no. Mm -hmm. And so that, like, that's really real. I want a child. I want to start a family, but I also feel like my life is worth something. Mm -hmm. And that decision, like, that's immediately what I thought about, like having to tell my husband, I would not feel comfortable being pregnant in Tennessee. Yeah, that's real. That's real. Um, Yeah, no, it's just, you know, it's one of those things I think uh, we, like we said, we talked about before, hoping, just hoping that, okay, you know what, they will keep this in place um, but am I surprised? No, because we know when Trump got in and the, these new justices that came under his administration and the purpose, why they were in there, um, starting what they did with Obama and not allowing him to do in McConnell on him, it was to get to this point. Um, and so, yeah, seeing that the need, the news leaked, you know, I was shocked like everyone else. One, I'm like, oh, this is to me. I don't know who did this. Right. And maybe it'll come out one day, but I'm like. Because this was such an important decision, I know there had to be somebody who saw that draft, one of the clerks. Nah, we can't. The world needs to know this, right, that this is happening um, and adjust. And maybe even in an attempt because reading some things, you know, there's still the, it's just a draft. And I've read before, I read in a couple of things saying that typically this is a common practice. They send a draft and sometimes things even change and votes even change as well because of the draft. So maybe it was this person who ever leaked, it was his last digit attempt, like, hey, before they finalize it, maybe there's a still percent chance that it can be reversed if it gets enough public attention, which I don't think they're going to do. Um, but I think that whoever under, whoever was there understood the mission and wasn't trying to play the political game and let's do what's right and keep it hush-hush and protect their world. Like, no, let's get this out there because everyone needs to be held accountable and catch them by surprise, right? So they can't plan and have this narrative around what happened and, and do all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, so I also heard like a theory that like did the right or extreme slide leak it. So mm-hmm. to kind of like temper protests in the summer when it hit. So when it actually mm-hmm. hits and it's true is not a shock. Mm-hmm. We've supposedly had two months to wrap our minds around like this is the new law of the land. 
Could happen too. Could happen too. Because yes, if it came out during the summer, especially when everybody outside and it's warm out, you going to get, and they still probably will. I don't, this is such an important issue. I don't see people just sitting there like, oh, okay, we got two months. And when they make that final decision, if it comes out to be what it is right now, they're still going to have protests. There's still people fighting tooth and nail to make sure that this, um, you know, that they, their at least their voices are heard and hopefully some changes are made. Um, so I don't know. I think it's like you said, I think it's, it's a scary situation for women. Um, uh, you know, I've, of course I've never supported anything aligned because if you, how you just discussed, you know, the, your personal thought process. And it's like, even if <clears throat> you have to consider this, that's a, already a tough decision, right? It's like a lot considered into an abortion and the reasons around it. And that decision needs to be up to those people because they're the ones who have to live with that, who have to deal with it and who have to accept it. And it's just like taking that power out of the hands of those who, especially women, right? Who is the most important uh, factor in this. That's just ridiculous to me. Um, and I don't know. I don't know you know, kind of where we go from here. We can have conversations about that, but I think it's just a really, you know, frightening situation to see where this country is heading um, and the ramifications. And this is just one major decision with a bunch of others down the pipeline that can go this way. Yes, and that's the scary thing. So they've already, you know, gutted the Civil, uh, the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. Um, They have been attacking affirmative action for the longest, and they're going to have the majority there. The Texas governor, I think, is trying to, if he hasn't already done so, introduce legislation that would challenge um, the rights of um, undocumented immigrants to a free public Mm -hmm. education. Because right now, the Supreme Court in uh, 1982 uh, held in the Plyler v. Doe decision that, you know, all children have the right to a free public education. And it seems like he's trying to challenge that now. And I have a friend who is a law professor and a legal expert. And he was talking about like the genealogy of these cases and how Mm -hmm. these cases are like built upon each other. So Mm -hmm. a lot of the times it's like, because of role, you might get like Plyler because of Brown, you might have gotten wrote. And like, I don't know the exact genealogy, but they were just talking about like how these cases are built on them. And like, once you can, like, it's like a Jenga block. Once you can mm-hmm. pull one out, you can start pulling the other ones out. And all of our rights are potentially could be revoked because one of the, uh, aspects of that uh, opinion that people have really been um, kind of like zoning in on is like the idea of like, if it's not in the constitution, you know, if it's not like these deeply rooted rights or traditions, then it's not a right that can be protected. And -hmm. think about how many rights that applies to education, is not listed in the constitution. Um, Mm -hmm. Black folks being like citizens, like it's a lot of things that they could like Mm -hmm. go back on. And by like knocking things down, like one block at a time, like, oh my God, I've said this before. Yo, they are so damn strategic. Like this has been in a work for like 50 years. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They've been yeah. plotting for 50 yeah. years. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a really scary situation. I think um, I read some stat one time, uh, students, we came upon it. It was something along the lines like America is like the only first world kind of country that hasn't changed their constitution, like updated it. We're the only ones that still are, you know, beholden to this original document, which is absurd because so many things have changed. And the fact that we're using this as basis to take people's, uh, you know, decisions and livelihoods away um, and change, you know, just the fabric of this country off of this document from the 1700s. um, That is wild. And I think that um, that has to be a part of the discussion too. It's like, should this be, is this now ethical? Right. Uh, Because like you said, all these things, there's so many different things. Including black folks, right? That were not considered 
when they were writing that. And now we're using that as a basis to create these laws, um, federal laws, which have always been protection for us marginalized populations, people of color, women, et cetera. Um, and now um, plays a big role. A couple um, things like talking about that genealogy. I did see this article on NPR just to mention a couple of the cases um, that you uh, kind of were um, alluding to. One is like this Griswold versus Connecticut, which I think has to do with marital privacy and, and contraception, which again comes from, you know, the genealogy of Roe v. Wade. Um, and again, both, I think, uh, you know, Amy Coney Barrett um, says that she is on the fence about that, right? So again, these are kind of the scary things, right? Um, she wasn't like, uh, you know, super, you know, uh, beholden to what was already in place. Um, Lawrence v. Texas, um, I think has to do with, um, oh, um, I think uh, uh, this is one of the issues I've been seeing too about the LGBTQ community, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and marriages, et cetera, and recognizing that um, because they used to have these like anti-sodomy laws, all these kind of ridiculous things. And now, you know, again, this is a derivative of that, an extension of that. And this last one they have was a, uh, Obergefell and versus Hodges, uh, which is again talking about same sex marriages too. Um, and so I know, hey, this can be, especially because a lot of the rationale these states are using to throw abortion out the window, right? Uh, religious reasons be the same reasons they do the same thing for gay rights, right? And gay marriage, et cetera. Religious reasons is not rec Supreme Court say, well, this isn't recognized in the Constitution. Then now these states use religious reasons to say why they're creating these laws. And now here we go again. Yeah, I feel, I don't want to say stupid, but I feel like just so naive because I was having a conversation with a friend, a LGBT um, a QIA friend, or they're in that community. And mm -hmm. this person had to make a decision about a job and they, you know, had a blue state decision and a red state decision. And they were like, you know, I am not sure about potentially moving mm. to a red state. Like, mm -hmm. what if they overturn, like, gay marriage? And I'm like, oh, it's it's a Supreme Court to say, I'm like, no. Like, and it's just kind of like, for me, well, you know what? I did at the time say, like, it's not my duty to, like, tell you what you should be worried about but I can't say in the back of my mind I'm like no that's not gonna happen so I didn't explicitly say it wouldn't happen but I was just like come on like and and it's just like yeah it might fall like a domino and speaking of mm -hmm. LG the LGBTQIA community so you know this is an issue that impacts women it is also an issue that impacts non-binary people as mm -hmm. well as trans men um, mm -hmm. who can give birth. Um, if you, you know, have certain reproductive organs, you can. So this is a women's issue. This is also an LGBTQIA issue, given that it impacts non-binary and uh, certain trans people. Nope, that is definitely, um, you know, been some of the biggest responses to this outside of the, you know, immediate ramifications for women and their rights, um, but also the looking down the line of what how this affects other communities as well. Um, like I said, the non-binary, LGBTQI rights, all these kind of things. It's a very scary situation. And so, yeah, what's making this the issue, what we know is the... is. To me, it's like, are we on? A, are we going to be on the brink of a civil war again? Um, because it is just I like, say, I, <laughs> I, oh, oh my god! Like that was also. I didn't text it to John, but that was something that I texted to a friend. Mm -hmm. I the the feeling I had on that night was the same feeling that I had when I woke up on the morning that Trump was declared uh, president elect. Cause I went to bed mm -hmm. knowing what was going to happen. But when I woke yeah. up and it was like a reality, I had like this feeling. It was just like, mm, yeah, it, it just, I just knew I saw where we were going. Mm -hmm. And I had that same feeling that the night that this, this leaked, I'm like, we are headed toward like some real dystopian type stuff. 
as many mm-hmm. laws and freedoms that they can roll back for people who are not white, cis, hetero Christians, mm-hmm. the more they will. And that is scary because this is going to impact all of us. I think we even said last week, it was like something about like doctors not having to treat, uh, I think it was not having to treat LGBT uh, people and I had said something mm-hmm. like, now nah, we need to care because it ain't just going to impact them. Like this yeah. is going to get to everybody. And mm-hmm. I think there, I don't know if it keeps going in this direction, it's not a situation is. Yeah. It's, I don't see this ending well. It's not a recipe for, yeah. Uh, it's, it is a recipe for disaster. I'll say that. Um, Because when we look at the states, um, it's already becoming dramatic, you know, tension and stark differences between the states. And we know that, yes, there are some states who are not going to touch and uphold and say, you know what, it's we're going to, you know, uphold Roe v. Wade. These and most of them are blue. Right. Um, These the the women are going to have their rights, the decision. And the majority of middle America saying the complete opposite, where we are destroying this. We are making sure that no one can have abortions here, which is the scary thing. Even in these red states too, right? We're talking about the early beginning, something like a civil war, right? Loosening all these gun laws, right? Nobody needs permits anymore. Nobody needs permits to carry. Anybody can buy, right? Now you're arming up this population, right? Some scary things can come from it. I know I've seen conversations that said folks saying this is the beginning. This was the beginnings of um, Hands Maze Tale, right? How these kind of things uh, started to progress and move in these directions, um, so yeah, it's like really now it's real conversations that we had, um, about where do I want to start a family, right? Where do all my kids to get educated? All these conversations around CRT, things of that, like that nature. Also just gun safety, right? And violence. Um, you want to be around that all the time. And it's like night and day now, uh, where a lot of these, uh, states, and this is the issue, federal rights, the federal government says, you know, we don't have to create regulations for everyone. Now states can do whatever they want voting rights, et cetera. And now we're going to be in a lot of trouble. And I don't know how we come back from this. Yeah. Speaking of that Handmaid's Tale thing, did you see the screenshot in the opinion where it directly talked about um, there being a shortage in domestic supply of infants for adoption? Oh, wow. And, you know, Amy Coney Barrett has adopted. And so it was a part like so in the draft, it was like a footnote that was, of course, like trying to support Mm -hmm. it. But it's just kind of like when you're talking about a domestic supply of infants that you need Mm -hmm. and you're trying to restrict abortion, you know, there's a hashtag. I think it's called Adoptee Voices because I've actually been learning a lot about the the dark side of adoption and mm. how there's a lot of like extremely troubling things related to it. And in that conversation that adult adoptees were having related to this opinion that seems like they're trying to get a handmaid's tale, like steady supply of babies that can be adopted by infertile couples or whatever. They talked about uh, the baby scoop era in the United Mm. States history, which happened after World War II. It ended in the 1970s, probably around the time that Roe v. Wade went into effect. But what happened Mm. was like, there was like a higher rate of newborn adoptions and a lot of it took place with like unwed mothers who probably Mm -hmm. if abortion had been an option would have otherwise Mm -hmm. done that. Mm. That's some scary stuff. Yeah. That's some scary stuff. And there's a lot of, you know, I know one of the bigger issues with this too is the class issues, right? One adoption is not cheap and you got to have money and resources to do that kind of stuff. Um, But also the implications of the class issues of who can still get abortions if they want. If you have money, you can travel to a different state. You can have the resources to do. It. And if you don't, you're going to be the most subjected to these policies, these really strict policies against abortion and get the most, 
you know, punitive measures placed upon you. And these are folks in marginalized communities who are going to suffer the most. And these rich folks who care about these laws, if they want to get abortion, they still going to get one. Right. Um, and I think that's the, just another um, evidence of, of the injustice of these kind of and things. And they surely will. These same politicians that are enacting the law will get abortions for their daughters or their mm-hmm. mistresses or whatever it is. Their mistresses. Yeah, and yeah. Like, yeah. So I will say it seems like something like, if you need to get one in the future and go to another state, keep it hush hush. Because I did hear that like some states might try to enact laws to where mm-hmm. these bounties, you can try to sue a practitioner in another state for performing abortion for somebody that lived in the current state. So, baby, you need to move in silence if you need one. Like that's yeah. It abortions are not going to stop happening. They're just mm-hmm. going to stop happening in certain states. And to the extent possible, if it's a choice that you have to make for yourself and for your family, don't tell nobody. Yeah, this is um, this um, article I was reading about this. I think it was in, in political as well, where they're talking about how this may change the game with digital surveillance um, because, you know, we know HIPAA, Things, you know, they have to be confidential. So there's some things that authorities, if they want to punish or, you know, penalize somebody for doing these things, they can't get that kind of information. But with this new age of technology, um, you know, we know you've heard of things like police tracking folks off of the pings off the, you know, cell phone towers that you can track the movements once you get like a number. Um, But also there's things that are not protected under HIPAA because now all these smartphone devices are, you know, they track our information. You get your heartbeats, your blood pressure, all these different kind of things that you input information in or just automatically gets input in. And so that, that that information is not protected under HIPAA. So these states may begin to enforce laws or create things where there's like this open, you know, communication between, especially in criminal cases, right? Uh, you get access to this information from these companies and now the information that you thought was protected or should be protected under HIPAA isn't because, you know, it's through these technology things. And so they can use that to, again, survey, track or use as evidence to say, hey, you did this or why were you at this clinic at this time, et cetera, et cetera. And now p- punish you because of it. So, um, yeah, that's scary. Too. I heard about that. So there was actually I'll, I'll try to see if I can find the article, but there was a period tracking app that does actually send data. Mm. Like if you're using the app to track your period, they're like, they're sending the data. I think it was to Facebook and some other like sites, Mm. even if you didn't have a Facebook profile or something, I'll Mm -hmm. find the name while you're, you know, when you're talking, because I can't like type and like search for that and like talk like that. But (laughs) it is being careful. I actually found out there was another state that was, track uh like the i don't know if it was the attorney general or it was some type of law official was like tracking like the plant parenthood patients or like who had Mm. been there and like their last periods and stuff like that and i also Mm -hmm. read that um some states some state funded crisis pregnancy centers have contracts with states to collect data for callers seeking abortion. So it's like, mm. oh, you know, you see those billboards, you're pregnant, you don't know what to do, call this number. Well, if you're seeking an abortion, depending on the state that you're in, they might be tracking that to try mm. to uh, criminalize you. And in Louisiana, they actually want to be able to uh, charge people with murder for abortion. Wow. And it's not even at implantation, it's at fertilization. Wow. That's crazy. That's wild. I think um this is this article I saw on NPR that talks about some of those uh you know the the claims, the facts versus fiction uh claims around abortion. One, and this is what's been I think troubling me, you know, outside of these decisions, but the most about this country over these past few years is that this country is not a democracy anymore. The minority rules this country. If we look back from presidential elections from 2000, the majority public popular vote has always voted Democrat, right? Democrats have always won. So that means we wouldn't have a Trump. We wouldn't have a George Bush, et cetera. And then when we're looking at these abortion um, stats, you know, Pew Research and other places have looked at 
you know, percentages and 61 percent of folks said that they believe abortion should be legal. Again, so it's that 39 percent over here that are getting all the uh, uh, get what getting what they want. And the rest of the country has to be subjected to this nonsense and these overturning and these policies. Um, you know, there's uh, uh, argument that after Roe v. Wade, that abortions have skyrocketed. No, uh, abortions are actually lower than they were in 1973 at the rates in 1973 compared to what they are today. Um, another claim talking about um, uh, people getting abortions late in pregnancy. That is also not the case. Right. And also that the fetuses can feel pain. They can't even feel pain until um, the third trimester. Right. And so most pregnancies, 43 percent are done before six weeks. Most abortions are done before six weeks and another 36 percent on top of that. So you're having almost 75 percent of abortions are done before nine weeks of pregnancy. So this is before they even um, they're only, you know, two thirds away their first trimester uh, when this is happening. And so, again, these arguments that are being made to, uh, you know, support this are just completely false. And then also um, more than 60 percent of abortion patients have a religious affiliation because of part of the argument, oh, people who are religious don't get abortions, which is also not true, right? So pretty much every claim that they're making to overturn this to justify it, it's completely false, not backed by any kind of fact or evidence, but again, it's being used to support these things and these people are holding on to this stuff that are all just lies. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the the company that was um, just had a settlement with the FTC was Flow. Uh, that's okay. a period tracking app and... Uh, They had a settlement over allegations that it shared, despite saying that they wouldn't, shared uh, health data with third party app analytics for marketing services, um, sharing it with like places like Facebook. But other people, uh, other apps, according to this article with TechCrunch, that have been found to share users data includes Baby Center, Clue, Flow, my calendar and uh, Avia. So just, just wow. We are living and like we did it to ourselves. We surveil ourselves. Like we have put ourselves in the matrix. Yeah. Yeah. That's the scary thing with the technology. And there's really, you know, what are the ethics around this stuff? What is, you know, what can the government, get, if they get their hands on, what could this mean? Um, which they're, you know, they are definitely trying to push to get their hands on this kind of data because this is what have made these companies so lucrative is that they were able, they get so much information now, especially when I was just thinking about yesterday, I was like, how long, I was trying to remember how long have I had an iPhone, right? Like I think I've had an iPhone, I don't even know, it has to be 10 plus years that, I, you know, I upgrade, and I get new, but it's always an iPhone. So that means this company like has had my data, even if I haven't been on social media, act right? They just, the data they have for me personally, whatever I put in the phone, the apps I use, things like that, they've been tracking me for well over a decade. And so that's a really scary thing to be like, what if Apple decides to hand over information or the government wants to look at things? They have so much information on me um, that I was just willingly giving to them. I'm like, and there's nothing I can do about it at this point, right? Um, and it's just, yeah, it's just things like that that are like, they have me thinking really hard about where we're heading and the possibilities of what what can happen if we were moving into this hands made type type of era, right? Like, if they want to, if they get the information, they can do a lot with it. Yep, um, it's it's just scary, um, mm-hmm. and with all of these extreme laws, just like protect yourself, um, and. Hopefully we can find a way to respond. There was discussion about there being a way for um, Congress to codify the rights to an abortion, but it would require them to, um, they would either need some Republicans or else they're blocked because of the filibuster. Um, But there is a way for them to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that I saw an article that Stacey Abrams is now, you know, diverting her attention from her uh, campaign for governor to like raise funds to like fight like for Roe v. Wade and stuff like that. So just thinking about where we go from here and like, are we just going to be steamrolled back into the past? That's a scary thing. Um, yeah. Um, you know, I heard about that process. Um, 
yeah, with Congress, they would have to first remove the filibuster, and then that would pave the way for them to to codify it. Um, and then this would be moot. I also heard that there's um, there was this Yale professor um, who was on the news. Um, I was just randomly watching. She was on there, and you know the headline was um, how uh, medicinal abortions, like if you take a pill or whatever, will make this um, all these policies moot. Um, because I think the policies are about like medical procedures and there's already, you know, I think there's already some, you know, uh, medical, like medicine, medicinal types you can take that leads to abortion. And there's still, that's still advancing. And that might even push it to advance even further that that can't be considered illegal. Um, right. If you can do over the counter things or they can give a prescription, it's not actually a procedure, then all these laws don't even matter anymore. And she's saying, you know, keep your eye on that too, because that will be a loophole where these states can't, um, you know, affect you in those ways. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, you know, where do we go from here? Don't know. I do feel like the more and more we get into this game and seeing how majority of folks in this country make sense and are reasonable, but yet we are helpless when these policies are put in place with its voting, with its guns, with its abortion, with its gay rights does not matter. Um, we just sit here and be like, this is what we want. And this was 60% of Americans want and this is what we don't get. So I, it's just like, what can we do, right? What can we do as a nation? What can we do as a people to to get um, these these folks, the minority, out the way? I don't know, right? We are getting steamrolled, and that's just the bottom yeah. line. And it's going to continue to go no matter how much we fight, no matter how much we protest. These Republicans just keep winning and winning and winning. Trump's impact on this nation will be for a very long time. He did not even win the popular vote but he put three people on a Supreme Court who will change the cor- the course of history for probably the, at least the rest of our lifetime. Like they will have to die and, you know, be replaced by people who actually care about, you know, other people for this to be overturned. So it's just like, wow. That that one election just it changed. So and that was the one thing I was worried about, the Supreme Court. Like I wasn't even pro Hillary. The Supreme Court mattered. And he yep. got three yep. picks. Yeah. Tr- Donald Trump out of all the people in this country got three picks to the Supreme Court. Um somebody's not even a politician. Um, yeah, that, 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 that presidency is going down in the history books is the presidency that changed. Yeah. The course of this country. Um, so yeah, you know, it's like one of the situations where we try to keep hope alive and, you know, you want to keep fighting, but at some point it's just like, when is enough enough? You know, when are we going to get that breath of fresh air? When are we going to get that hope again? We're going to get things overturned. Now this is to me, again, I'm not an advisor for Biden and them, but Hey, Y'all wanted to boost up the Democrats. You codify this. You do what you have to do to codify this. That is a win for y'all heading into midterm season, right? That is a big, 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 you know, um, uh, fight back against what the conservatives are trying to do. Um, And they have the power to do it. Will they do it? No, right? Of course not. Uh, But if I were them and you already desperate for moving forward into this upcoming fall, and that's the move. That's kind of that, um, you know, nuclear option. You're going to have to pull at this moment to save this country and you got to do it. Uh, but, you know, that's I think that's a long shot. That's just yeah. me, you know, going out of prayer. And then they, <laughs> they're also not only under his watch will Roe v. Wade be overturned. He'll be blamed for it, although this is because of what happened with Trump. But mm-hmm. They'll also have some responsibility because there was something that could be could have been done like in Congress. Mm -hmm. And then he going to probably come with some weak student loan stuff. And it's just kind of like just throw the whole Democratic Party away. (laughs) We do really need to rebuild. Um, We do really need to rebuild. And, you know, I'm not. I'm not, uh, you know, fighting fire with fire. I know as they say is in the best way, but honestly, when people's lives are at the line, women's lives, babies' lives, voting rights, everything is on the line. We got to fight fire with fire. We need somebody to come in. That's just like, I'm not playing with these 
Republicans are not playing with these conservatives. Y'all are doing too much damage. And you kind of need that, you know, that knight in shining armor on the other side to come in and just <laughs> save the day. Uh, but I think Democrats are still trying to play this game, right? The safe way, the quote unquote right way. And as a result, you're playing with people who are not playing by the rules. You're playing with people who don't give a, give a damn about the rules and are getting what they want. And now we're all just sitting here suffering. Um, and so, yeah, you know, we got to have somebody that kind of breaks the rules a little bit and get, gets gets the right things in place. We just know what's the right things. And I'm sorry, we got to do it now at this yeah. point. <laughs> and also Democrats got to learn how to play offense. They always playing yeah. defense and losing. You're right about that. You're this right happened about that. because like I have said, they're like, um, mm, I can't think of, well, one, there's this book where we interviewed, uh, we interviewed Chris Parker, Professor Chris Parker, mm-hmm. Remember, mm-hmm. Change They Can't Believe In. And then there's this another book, uh, there's another book called, um, I can't think of the name, but it's about the Tea Party. And what reading these books, the Tea Party book and this book, just showed me like how strategic mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, they mm-hmm. are. Like, it's kind of like, a, we ain't even trying to win the public. Uh, we mm-hmm. just trying to, like, we're trying to beat them with, uh, what do they say? Like in the legislature, like we mm-hmm. we will know the law better than them so that we can mm-hmm. beat them. You know what I'm saying? It's kind yeah. of like a yeah. it's called the Tea Party and the re- remaking of uh, Republican conservatism. And it kind of talked mm-hmm. about like the. It was both ground level and top down strategy in terms of one taking over the Republican Party as it had been to make it a little bit more like extremely conservative uh, or extremely right. But also like in, I think in their little in their little town hall meetings, they like learning about the Constitution. They learning about these legislative processes and legislative moves to outsmart Democrats. So, and that's the thing, people can call like, oh, they're so backwards. They're so stupid. No, they are smart as shit. They are smart. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, they are. They are. That's 100% true. Ain't no no doubt about that. They are killing us in the strategizing game. Like you said, they are playing offense. Democrats out here worrying about democracy and getting the most votes. And they don't, we don't need the most votes. We just need to create these laws. And feel good, my Mm -hmm. girl. I don't care about that t-shirt. I no, yeah. like yeah, you know that it was very cool to get a black woman on the Supreme Court. Oh, with, you know Ruth and uh, you know uh, Judge Kataji. Like no, that don't make me feel good. Like actually, mm-hmm. get some get some stuff done. That will yeah, make me feel get it good. done. And I didn't want to say that's it all at we want to see because I didn't want to rain on people's parades. But that's how yeah. I actually felt like, no, this isn't a feel good moment for me. Like, yes, I'm happy she's there. But like, can we talk about what we actually going to do? Yeah. Yeah. And and it was just to me, I mean, yes, it was important. but It was symbolic. Like her being on there is not changing. It's not changing anything. They still have the majority and she's going to vote the way we expect how like Sotomayor has been voting. Right. Like we know what they're going to do, but it's still not enough to create any change because now they all have to sit and watch Roe v. Wade get overturned as well they don't support it so um i think that's the biggest issue we have to start look moving past this symbolism and symbolic gestures with the democratic party and we're like no y'all need to get something done please for the love of god for the love of his country get something done um so now like we said we have already been predicting this and looking back at the about four and a half years of us doing this podcast, our predictions have always been pretty pretty on point and i think there's going to be a if less Democrats do something to surprise all of us in these next couple of months. This midterm is going to be a slaughter. Yeah. It's going to be a slaughter. And I'm already expecting Republicans just to take everything. And now we're going to be suffering for those next couple of years okay. again. Because what worse. they did, oh my God. Let them get control of everything. One, they've already remade our complete, you know, our judicial system by getting all of their important, like, People don't mm-hmm. realize how important courts, the courts are. Oh my goodness. Mm-hmm. And like mm-hmm. to get Republicans back in control is, I, I don't know. I don't know. 
Child. But it's funny that you mentioned Simplest because what I wanted to tweet, like right after like uh, Justice Kitaji Brown Jackson was uh, confirmed is like Mm -hmm. Democrats only care about symbolic victories. That's it. That's it. You will see all the hand prayers. You will see the tears and the crying and everybody so emotional. And at the end of the day, uh, we still suffering. Um, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But hopefully, you know, I think I'll have more hope if Biden just does the right thing and steps down this next presidential election. Let's get fresh candidates, a new pool um, that can re-energize. And I would be excited about because Biden is not going to excite me. But if I have my choosing again, we can pick. Just like the Republicans will have to pick, I think that'll just um, increase the chances of Democrats pulling something off and giving us a new narrative. But that's a far away from that because I don't know if you've been seeing Dav. I'm seeing a lot more videos of Biden and he is not looking OK um, after all these speeches and things. And, you know, I saw the one that happened a couple of weeks ago. He was just like handshaking the air and just his, the way he talks and things he say, not making a lot of sense, not being coherent. Um, when he's going off script, it's, it's pretty scary. Um, and, you know, I think his age is definitely catching up to him and he is not the sharpest right now. And I think um, he just need to go ahead and, and step down after this presidency. Agreed. Agreed. And. Yeah. Uh, yeah okay. Um, so, yes, uh, we want to just, you know, take some time. <laughs> I don't know. Is there, is there anything this. positive you can say to end on like a, a good, let's end on a happy note, like. I, I don't know if there's anything positive about this. Um, um, <laughs> about, I don't know. Tell me, about this tell me something good you got planned for this week or something. I don't know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Great in my papers, Dab. Great in my papers. That is it. And finishing this semester um, and sending off my seniors. You know what I mean? That's the only you know positive thing I would say that's coming about this week. But I don't know. I mean, politically, I mean, this was a tough conversation, but this is why I felt like we need to talk about it because, you know, I think our listenership does like the hear, you know, our thoughts and our takeaways and some of the information we can provide to help folks leave with a more insight. But at the end of the day, this is, hey, sometimes, what do they say when you are, you know, you're grieving or you're going through things, sometimes you got to sit in it for a little bit, you can't stay in it, you just got to sit in it. And it's just one of those moments you got to sit in it and process what's going on and then, you know, gather the strength to move forward. Because it yeah. sucks. I mean, that's real. <laughs> We gotta like sit in reality. I, I want them like what's positive, yeah. but like this is the reality. So yeah. yeah, this is the reality. I don't think there's anything positive to pull away from this decision at all. Um, but you know, hopefully there's still room for hope and positivity to come from it. So we'll see in these next couple of months, and we will definitely keep y'all updated as time moves forward. Um, but okay. Um, hopefully y'all got something out of this and at least got our takeaways and the things, information you have or takeaways you have, please, by all means, you know, hit us up. The way you can do that is social media or on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, um, at BHC podcast. If you're watching us, this entire episode is on YouTube. So you can also, you know, go to YouTube, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Black Eye Dangerous, like leave a like, write a comment about your thoughts, um, of this episode or things we were talking about. We always appreciate that. And you can always email us bhdpodcast at gmail.com if you want to just say hello or have, you know, some longer suggestions that might be outside the realm of a DM or a, a comment. Um, and visit our website, blackandhighdangerous.com. You can check all the latest content, latest episodes on there. And then you can uh, review and uh, rate us on iTunes. That helps us out with the algorithm so that more people can find us. So if you haven't yet, please review and rate us on iTunes. And then after you do all that, share us with your friends, share us with your family. Shares with the enemies and has always continued to be the oppressor's worst fear. If you're interested in continuing this and other conversations, visit our website, blackandhollydangerous.com to subscribe to our email list, suggest topics and participate in our discussion forums. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook at BHD Podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe and rate our podcast on your favorite platform. And as always, continue to be the oppressor's worst fear.